What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This episode number 432. My name is Marshall. I'm one of your limited resources. And joining me on the line all the way from Denver, Colorado, it's Luis Scott Vargas. Luis, how are you, buddy? Uh, I'm doing great. Doing great. Um, looking forward to GP Seattle, which is, I know not the next GP, but it's my next GP. So I, I'm kind of, kind of juiced for that. And then, uh, of course, Masters 25, which... You know, as of recording, came out a couple hours ago on Magic Online. Haven't had a chance to actually play yet, but you know, I, I've watched some 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 streams. So we'll, we'll see if we we can talk about it today here. Yeah. So I, I've actually I've done one draft already. I made it to the finals, but ended up losing. Um, but we're going to be talking about it today. Masters Twenty Five. This is your set primer for it. Now, this is kind of our middle ground type show when it comes to getting you ready for a set. There's for the full releases, we'll do. Uh, our card by card set reviews that everybody comes to to listen for, but for these reprint sets, we find it more useful to do things like a primer show, which gives you a broad strokes overview of what the of what the cards are doing and what the set wants to do, but doesn't have the heavy lift of doing every single card when they're all reprints anyway. And many of our audience, in fact, the majority of it, won't get to draft this set, but maybe one time. And so it just makes more sense for us to do a more compact show around it. And that's what we're going to do today. Before we get into that, I've got to mention our sponsor. That's ChannelFireball.com. Make sure you check them out for everything you need on the internet, magic-related, including content. That's right. Uh, Luis, I saw that you wrote an article about a legacy deck that you've been playing so people can uh, get in on that a little bit. Uh, I got a legacy cube video up. You've got some rival stuff, uh, you know, for, for video side of things. And then of course, while you're there, you can pre-order Dominaria right now. That's right. Dominaria, the next big set for magic. I know a lot of people are excited about that and I'm one of them. So you can get on channel fireball and get yourself all pre-ordered up. They'll get it out to you right away. You can support the show directly via Patreon. That's patreon.com slash limited resources. I've got something to give away here. We've got a pile of cards from our crack of packs that I'm going to be giving away. And uh, our winner actually comes all the way from Belgium. This is Emilian Wild. And actually, I know Emil. He's, uh, he's yeah. a judge. Yeah, he, he judges yeah. at his pro tour. At all the pro tours and a lot of the Grand Prix. Yeah. So, Emil, you know what I think I'm going to do is I'm probably going to take this with me to the next pro tour and just hand it to you in person rather than risk <laughs> the nonsense of, uh, of the postal department. Thank you so much, Emilian, and everybody else who supports us uh, via the Patreon. Oh, and that reminds me. I've got a Patreon question of the week. I just refreshed the thread uh, just recently. Let me just grab one of our questions here. Um, this one says, uh, Luis, you are one of the most insane. You're on, uh, you were on one of the most insane hot streaks in the history of Magic leading up to your year of not playing PT so you could do coverage. You're a great player, near consensus, top five of all time, I would say, but rust is real and you took Good a year question. off. This is, I, I <laughs> yeah. really like Moving right doing. along. <laughs> he says, but rust is real and you took a year off from uh, from competing against the best players at the biggest stage. How did you prepare for your return to the pro tour and uh, unfortunate results aside, would you, how would you rate your preparation and play? Unfortunate results. I went 11 and five at the pro tour. <laughs> I, I, I don't, and I don't know under what definition that's unfortunate, but uh, I will still answer the question in the spirit of, uh, as it was asked. Was that um, your first PT back? Mm hmm. What was the one? Did you bombed out at something recently? Didn't the, you? the last pro tour, I did. The last um, pro tour. Maybe that's what what Jason was referring to there. I can't I can't blame that one on, on Rust as much uh, because okay. I was playing a lot beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was like, that was more me playing Grixis Death Shadow, which did not win a game with that deck. Um, well, I, I think in either case, the best way to shake Rust off is the the very unexciting answer of, you know, play more. And I played a lot uh, leading up to. Pro Tour Ixalan was the first Pro Tour I, I was back for. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was pretty happy, especially since playing draft was, I think, the where the biggest gain is. Because in general, limited and, you know, this works out really nicely for people who listen to the podcast. Limited is where I think you get the biggest edges in Magic these days. Mm -hmm. I think that two people playing standard or modern or legacy and most any constructed format if both players, you know, have played with their deck a decent amount, even if one player has played a lot more, the edge is just not going to be huge. Whereas in limited, the difference between someone who really understands the ins and outs of a draft format and how all the cards do against each other uh, is going to have a pretty marked advantage. And I ended up going 5-1, you know, drafting vampires and pirates and be feeling pretty happy about, you know, my card evaluation and kind of like where I was at in the format. 
Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, my preparation was pretty good. I think my my play was good, though. I did mess up one of the rounds of Constructed, certainly. This is playing Teamer, where the field was like, you know, 40% Teamer, 40% Monored, 20% people who didn't want to win the Pro Tour. And uh, <laughs> ended up... Uh, That's brutal. Not making a token in response to my World of Virtuoso dying because I was playing too fast. And this is something that I warn a lot of other people about. If you're someone who plays more intuitively, especially more quickly, both of those are things I, I, I'm pretty high on the scale of, then not playing and trying to get back into it is really dangerous. Like that is where uh, I, I get tripped up a lot. And I've noticed that over the years because, you know, I go through periods where I play more or less. Like when I first started working, uh, you know, Direwolf as a game designer, mm -hmm. that was a big shift in focus because I all of a sudden had a full time job where I didn't before in addition to all the magic stuff. And my results dipped pretty precipitously because, well, I was trying to play the same way I did before without practicing as much. And right. that just doesn't work for me very well. So I think that uh, my preparation was, I don't know, probably like a nine out of 10 in terms of how much, how, how well prepared I felt. And my play was probably like, yeah, seven or eight out of 10 compared to like where I would like to be. But as always, these scales, you know, are are are, are not linear. So uh, seven out of ten and a ten out of ten are very different. But it takes a ton of work to go from seven to eight, eight to nine, eight to nine to ten. Yeah. And no, I, I feel like I'm going to be there for this GP. Uh, I've been I've probably played fifteen leagues or you know maybe twenty leagues with lands at this point. So <laughs> cool. That's great. I can't wait to see you play in that deck. Yeah, I, I just love the deck, and that's just a, the reason I'm going to play it. I'm not even claiming it's the best deck, but I think that's a, another lesson while we're at it is that you know playing decks you enjoy is really important, and playing formats you enjoy too. There's a reason neither of us you know jammed a ton of Ixalan, whereas I think yeah. with rivals we're just you know burning down our packs pretty or well stacking them up, but uh, yes. <laughs> cracking a lot of them. And yes, <laughs> it's just not something you can fake. So. Right. Um, that was a meandering answer, but you know, I'll give the I'll give the answer a six out of ten on the on, on the efficiency <laughs> scale. But, uh, How about we crack a pack? So, what, what I did, Luis, is since the set's not actually out yet, I got a pack on Magic Online. That, that works. And we're gonna crack it. So here we go. Yes, open one. Ugh, this feels dirty, but we're doing it anyway. All right, here is our pack. Uh, all right, so first card out. I guess I don't start with the rare, do I? Even though that's, yeah, where, that, that's where my eyeballs go. Thresher Lizard, two and a red, three, two. If you've got one or fewer cards in your hand, it gets uh, it becomes a four, four. This right. is not Iconic Masters. As this just showed up in M1 Cat and was not the... <laughs> and it was like, whatever. Uh, Ruthless like Ripper. Kind of world. No. <laughs> Ruthless Ripper is uh, black for a 1-1 one, one with Death Touch, but it's got uh, Morph. And uh, so you can play it face down as a 2-2 two, two for three mana. And you can uh, unmorph it by revealing a black card in your hand. And when it's unmorphed uh, or when it's turned face up, target a, a player loses two life. It's a good little card. Yeah, I, I, I like Ruthless Ripper. I, I don't think I'd be happy for us picking it in a, in a format this powerful, but I still think it's a good card. Yeah, same. Uh, next is Retraction Helix. This is, uh, this is blue for an instant. Until end of turn, target creature gains tap, return target non-land permanent to its owner's hand. We'll actually be talking about this one a little bit when we get into our primer because uh retraction helix has a friend in this set and uh we'll mention that but i don't i wouldn't be first picking it at least i don't think so primal clay which mediocre creature do you want would you like a four mana two two flyer a four mana three three artifact or a four mana one six defender those are your choices <laughs> uh, none of the above like yeah primal clay back when it was printed back in antiquities it was like kind of like two and a half good deals. Like a four mana three, three was good. A two, two flyer was good. And a one, six was like, okay, now it's like three bad deals. And I, I'm really, despite the flexibility, I'm not in for a card. that's three bad deals. Right. And that's, that's the problem is that flexibility generally you, you, you agree that you will take something a little bit worse for it, but when they're all just bad deals, it's like, come on, uh, pacifism, one and a white enchant creature can't attack or block. There's a card. Pacifism is good. Uh, not still not a card. I'd be excited to first pick but it is a card that uh i would imagine you're always going to play and you'll take fairly highly yeah uh kavu climber three uh green green for a three three and when it enters the battlefield you draw a card i am actually more of a fan of this in sets like this than you okay. might think this card uh, seems well, bad to me i mean i love cantrips but like a three three you might think i'd be a fan <laughs> to begin with, but, yeah <laughs> well when everyone has good cards 
card advantage is really important and you can make mm -hmm. up for inefficiency in cards like this if they're with good efficient removal at common. So okay. this yeah. might actually be better in a set that's more powerful because each average card is more powerful and because you have more ways to make up efficiency as opposed to a normal set where all the removal costs four mana. Okay. Uh, Jackal Pup, red for a 2-1, and whenever it's dealt damage, it deals that much damage to you. Bad dog. Yeah, this is good in an aggressive red deck, but I, I, so far I have not seen a single card where I'd be happy to first pick. Yeah, Pacifism is the closest to that. Giant Growth is back. Talk about Iconic Green. Target creature gets plus three, plus three until end of turn at instant speed. Good combat trick, but again, uh, moving along. Epic Confrontation. This is one in a green for a sorcery. Uh, target creature you control gets plus one, plus two until end of turn. It fights target creature you don't control. This is not bad. I, I, I'd i be in for this, especially since passivism uh, often gets worked over by bounce spells. And, you know, with mana war at common, if you pacify against a blue deck, there's just a good chance they can mana war their own creature, whereas... Epic Confrontation does not run into that. Plus, yeah. you can kill things like Morfolk Looter. Right. Uh, you know, one thing that I, I don't really mention, and we won't really mention the other part, is the specific card interactions. But Pacifism seems, at, at in some ways, at its absolute weakest in a set like this. There's many ways to sacrifice, blink, or bounce uh, creatures from underneath Pacifism, either to save them or for value. So even though it's still just too efficient to not play, uh, you know, I think that, you should keep that in mind. Uh, our foil, we do get one foil per pack here. It's called Echoing Courage. Um, it's one in a green instant target creature, and all other creatures with the same name as that creature get plus two, plus two until end of turn. My opponent, Echoing Courage today, and the creature that they targeted, which did have <laughs> a friend, was Wooly Loxodon. I'm like, come on, man. The six, seven? <laughs> yeah, and he had two of them attacking me. <laughs> What's going on here? Right, well, also bear in mind this works well with tokens because they all have the same name. But still, there you go. Yep. not a good part of first pick. Uh, Balduvian Horde, two red red for a 5-5 five, five human barbarian. When it enters the battlefield, sacrifice it unless you discard a card at random. Four mana 5-5. This, five, five. this was a $20 card when it first came out in Alliances. That you just mm. didn't get a four mana 5-5 five, five at the time. And uh, as cool as the card is and as much nostalgia as I have for it, I, I don't think you want to first pick this card, especially not over Passivism or Epic Confrontation. Yeah, I, I'm actually, I, I had the chance to play these in the deck I played today and I just passed on it. It just didn't seem that good. Uncommons, lore scale Kowatl, one Ooh, green like blue. One. Yeah, for a 2-2, two, two, whenever you draw a card, you may put a plus one, plus one counter on lore scale, lore scale Kowatl. It's a gold card, but it's a good one. It's, you know, by itself, it, draw, it gets plus plus one every turn, which is already good. And then if you combine it with, you know, cards like Sift or Fathom Seer, which are, cards you can get pretty easily mm -hmm. all of a sudden you got a six six or a seven seven i think i might actually be in for first picking lore scale quaddle here all right let's see if we can change your mind we got a couple more uncommons and then our rare uh next uncommon is heavy arbalest it's three mana equipment four to equip really hefty uh and the creature doesn't untap during its controller's untap step but the creature gets tap it does two damage to target creature or player that throwing around shocks like that is a pretty big game yeah, I don't, I don't like this card much. This is uh, from Scars of Mirrodin. And while that format was relatively fast, I can't imagine this format so much slower that this this kind of clunker is really what you want. It's more of a sideboard card. Yeah, I mean, I mentioned the Retraction Helix has a friend. Well, so does Heavy Arbalest, and they're the same card. It's Horseshoe Crab is in this set. So this is a right, combo the, card with Horseshoe The one three for three that you can pay a blue to untap it. So yes, yeah. that, is, that is a good combo. And if you have yeah. Horseshoe Crab, you will be putting Arbalest in your deck, I would imagine. Yep. Uh, last uncommon is Brine Elemental. Four blue blue for a five four elemental. Um, it's a morph. It unmorphs for five blue blue. So even a seven full seven mana. But when it is turned face up, each opponent skips his or her untap step. It's a five four. So you can kind of like if, if your opponent taps out and then you unmorph this, they just kind of you just time walk them basically. Yeah, they skip their untap, so you get extra attacks because none of their creatures untap. They don't get to play anything. They do draw their card, so you're mm, not, you're not and they have a land drop. Yeah, that. but I don't know. No, it, it is good though. Uh, is this good? Was a, I mean, that's a lot of mana. Yeah, it's pretty powerful. Like okay, it's a morph, so you can play it on three. You can also just cast it as a relatively big dork. I think Brian Elemental's good. I, I actually think I might take it here just because it's so powerful when you unmorph it. Okay, and you can often set up boards where. You'll get to hit with at least this twice, and they can't really do much about it. Yeah, it's pretty good. Our rare, Mystic Snake. One Ooh. green, blue, blue for a 2-2 two, two snake with flash. When it enters the battlefield, target counter-target spell. Oh, I love me a Mystic Snake. 
Mystic Sneak is pretty sweet. I think it's probably worse than Lore Scale Quaddle in blue green. Probably but, so. But can we? But is there any I, chance we take one and wheel the other? I don't think so. This doesn't strike me as a very powerful pack. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, so pacifism I, I think, stands out, and then there's a few cute cards, but nothing just raw power outside of these gold cards and maybe the Brine Elemental and the pacifism. Hmm. I I think I would first pick Brine Elemental here. It's just monocolor and pretty powerful, and doesn't really ask much of you besides just put it in your deck and it's going to be good. But I, I could see arguments for Epic Confrontation and Lore Scale Quaddle as well. I really don't think this is the format where you're like super happy about pacifism. I think it's a fine card. You'll play it, but it's just not like, yeah, yeah I got a Doomblade. Yeah, it's it's actually, and it's and Doomblade would be much, much better uh, for what it's worth. So what, what would you actually take? Your, your clock's ticking Brian down. Elemental. You take Brian Elemental. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take Mystic Snake. <laughs> <laughs> because I love Mystic Snake, and that's yeah, I mean, my reason. On, honestly, look, like we're, we're going to try to give you the best strategy we can in this episode, but we also have to really mention that this is a look back at you know a lot of Magic's sweetest cards. You, you should take the card you think is sweet. Like That is part of the, the reason you're drafting the set, especially one with a premium yeah. to enter. So that's I, right. I, I wouldn't blame you if you take Mystic Snake first here. All right, so let's get into this. Uh, first things first, set the table. So uh, Masters 25 is a reprint set, all reprints, no new cards, 249 cards. It's available on Magic Online now, and in real life, it releases in two days, March 16th, uh, from when we're recording this show. Uh, and this is what Wizards has to say about the sort of overall set. They said, Masters 25 takes players on a celebratory tour through some of the most powerful cards in all 25 years of Magic's history. The set includes fan favorites from each and every black bordered set from limited edition alpha through rivals of Ixalan. Masters 25 is designed to provide an exciting and unique limited experience with cards that have never been drafted together. So that's what Wizards is pitching. They're saying, look, we're going to pick cards, at least one from every black bordered set all the way from the beginning. So that's kind of cool. It's kind of like a tour through time for us. And maybe we get to go back in time a little bit and, and get a feel for that. But pretty neat. And uh, so... You know, that's kind of what they were going for. But I will say that going over the card list and after having done a draft as well, it does not look as streamlined as a normal M master set would be. Uh, for example, there's no tribal synergies here, like at all. Like there's no tribes in this thing. There's no big yeah. artifact. This uh, looks thing. more like a pile of good cards. Yes, that's exactly what it looks like. There's no spells matter, life gain, infect, all the things that you're used to. Like, think of the original Modern Masters, right? You were like, oh, I'm blue-white artifacts, or I'm, you know, uh, black-red goblins, or whatever. None of that seems to apply. The the It feels almost like, it's kind of like, <laughs> yeah, like a cube, but the, you know the weird thing? It actually feels like a cube where somebody said, okay, you got to pick cards from every set. Right. Like it has, it's a cube that has a caveat, not just pick all the cards that work the best together or design these archetypes. Instead, it's like you've got this, this, this task ahead of you as a cube designer that you need to pick a card from every one. Another, uh, comparison that kind of clicked was chaos draft. Right. You know, where you draft booster packs from all different sets, except for all the cards are good. Right. right. There's it's not, like there's none of the old jank in there. It's like a chaos draft, except you also took out all the like mirror enforcers that have affinity and the yes. you know goblin synergy cards from onslaught. Like you stripped all those out and just left the, just like the most powerful cards from each format, like you know swords to plowshares and mana war and, and murder and like mm -hmm. like you said, like a kind of like a lower rarity cube of of the sets from the past twenty five years. Yeah, and so since that's the case, the result is is that this is likely to be closer, like your decks are likely to be closer to like a pile of good, relatively synergistic cards rather than like streamlined, you know, I'm all merfolk or, or something along those this lines. It seems to me like it, it it's landing closer to where like Iconic Masters landed, mm -hmm. where a lot of the decks we had in Iconic Masters were not heavily themed. Right. So, and, and, and I think that that's a major deal. And so one of the overarching things that you're going to be looking at as we go through these is you're going to be drafting typical limited archetypes, meaning aggro, 
I'm going to curve out and I'm going to try to kill you with combat tricks, removal spells and, and, and cheap creatures, that kind of thing. Mid range, which can, you know, switch gears and maybe it's a little bit on the slower end or maybe it's a little on the faster end or whatever. Uh, maybe you have like a value mid range deck control, right? You, you're trying to build up inevitability where you can win a late game and get yourself to that late game. These are the more of the, the types of archetypes that you're going to see, which is we're all used to that. We talk about that all the time for the normal sets, but we're not used to that for. Uh, modern masters or excuse me masters style sets so that's that's kind of a, a different shift before we dive in and with that in mind um we decided to break these down based on the top commons and uncommons in each color rather than doing color pair breakdowns by archetype a because well, i haven't had a you know neither luis nor haven't have had enough time to play the set to have like a really fully fleshed out version of that but also it's less important here like in an older master set if we didn't tell you that blue white was the artifact color, th that would have been a disservice to you because you needed to know that. Here, the, they're just not as defined. It's really just a power level question. So I decided, hey, let's talk about each of the cards individually uh, uh, within their color. And that way you can get an idea of a snapshot of what each color looks like, what kind of good stuff they have at the top. And then uh, I went into uh, some deeper stuff later. So we're going to start with white. So here's a commons that I pulled as the the five white commons that really stood out to me. I'm not, I didn't try to rank them because uh, I didn't, I didn't, I wouldn't find that super useful at this point because you, you need a lot more context to really know what's what, but these are ones that just jumped out to me. So pacifism. Okay. We talked about that one. It's just powerful. So you have to keep it in mind. Um, path to peace. Have you seen that card before? I think it's Path of Peace. Or Path of Peace. That's what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. this is from uh, Urza Saga. It was the first time I remember playing with this. Three yeah. to white, sorcery, uh, destroy target creature, its controller gains four life. That's right. And so that's just another removal spell. And you know how it is. It's like, this is a set where you're going to need removal spells. And that those are going to be good. It's not the kind of thing where um, you're doing some wacky I mean, stuff. You know? yeah. Whenever we talk about removal, like, look at some of that, that premium uncommons from the set. You've got Fiend Hunter, right? Which... Exiles a creature till it leaves the battlefield. You've got Merfolk Looter, Murder of Crows, and uh, Spike Shot Goblin. Like the, these mm -hmm. are the kind of cards that if you don't have removal for, you're going to die very quickly to it. You're going to lose very quickly to it. You, you may not die to Merfolk Looter, but you are losing to it. Trust me. Yes. <laughs> you, you may not know it, but you are. Um, uh, Cloud Shift. This is one that caught my eye as a potentially abusable card. So this is white for an instant. Exile target creature you control, then return it to the battlefield under your control. We call that blinking. And so it's only your creatures, but this allows you to save your creatures from removal. Um, but more importantly, rebuy enters the battlefield effects. And that's something that you can do in great effect with some of the cards that Luis named. And we'll be talking about in the set, you know? Yeah. And we'll be talking. And of course, that made the list for the uncommons for the black one. Another thing I know about how Cloud Shift is templated, it's not just like a normal blink. If you act of treason, if you steal one of your opponent's creatures temporarily and then you Cloud Shift it, you get to keep mm -hmm. it forever. That's right. It doesn't say under its owner's control, it says under your control. And that's really cool, right? That's a really neat little wrinkle that doesn't I mean, come up to control often. magic. Even if it costs two cards, stealing one of their creatures permanently and getting a, a hasty hit in is, is really nice, especially since if you act of treason and attack them, they're not going to block it because they're going to be like, well, of course, it's coming back to me. And then after you hit them, you get to cloud shift it. So, Oh, that's great. I love that. That is super sweet. Uh, next one is white main lion, one in a white for a 2-2 cat with flash. When it enters the battlefield, you return a creature you control to its owner's hand. So once again, this has a similar thing as Cloud Shift where you can save your creature, but this one does go back to, to your hand. You're, you're going to, uh, you have to control it. So it's basically going to go back to your hand. And that does let you though, again, replay for value um, and save your creature sometimes. It does not have that extra uh, trick though that we mentioned there well, with Cloud what, Shift. What I'm seeing here is between Cloud Shift and White Mane Lion, you really have an incentive to get good enter the battlefield creatures, which you already did because this is yes. a master set and you, you want to get your value right away. But it just yeah. means that, that white's going to pair very nicely with cards like Mana War, Ravenous Chupacabra, or, you know, Urbis Protector within white itself. That's right. And so you're going to want to keep your eye out for that. Last one I picked was just a card that I remember liking a lot called Dauntless Kethar. It's two and a white for a 3-2 human soldier, and you can pay one and a white and exile it from your graveyard to make a 1-1 one, one white spirit creature token. Look, this thing isn't over the top or anything, but this is a good grindy kind of value card that you may want to keep your eye on as well. Uh, for uncommons, well, the big hitter, uh, as far as removal goes, probably 
the best. Oh, I did want to know spell. one more comment, by the way. Oh, uh, sure, sure. Squadron Hawk has a really big impact on every limited format. Okay. Uh huh. Shows yep. up. And Squadron Hawk at common, um, obviously, because it doesn't work very well at uncommon, means that it, your white deck's going to be very good at grinding. This looks a lot more grindy than it does aggressive. Definitely. So keep that in mind uh, for that mid range. Now, uncommon swords to plowshares, best removal right. spell ever printed. I mean, I, it's my number one. Oh, yeah. If that was a question, then yes, it, it, it is indeed the best removal spell ever printed, besides right. maybe counter spell. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And, and swords is is a swords plus shares is at uncommon in the set. So there you go. Um, a card that you mentioned a minute ago. By the way, here. Uh huh. I can't tell the difference between common and uncommon very easily. Like, oh, it's super hard to tell. Yeah. I just on the set the set icon. Like I'm looking at swords to plus shares squadron hawk next to each other. You know, in this visual spoiler, and I'm just like, yes, I can see it, but. I kind of have to squint, so. <laughs> no, I know. But I, I, when I went through and picked, I had them like selected that way. So I knew for sure because I, it's really hard to see. Uh, Urbis Protector, card that you, that you mentioned a few minutes ago, four, uh, white, white for a one, one. And when it enters the battlefield, you get a four, four, uh, white angel creature token with flying. And so, you know, boom, you, you play this card, you get your 4-4, and then if you can use one of those other abilities, you can use a white main line to pick it back up and recast it or a cloud shift to blink it. You're going to get free 4-4 four, four flyers, and I guarantee you the game doesn't go much longer in that scenario. And then the last one you also mentioned uh, is Fiend Hunter. Uh, and that Fiend Hunter is interesting because it's actually the old templating. And I'm going to go through how this works later on. Um, in specifics, just because it's kind of complicated, but it's one white, white for a one, three. When it enters the battlefield, you may exile another target creature. When it leaves the battlefield, you return the exiled creature to the ba battlefield under its owner's control. And again, I'll, I'll go into detail after we go through the, the cards about the, the things you can do with cloud shift and stuff with that. But needless to say, the card is excellent on its own and does not get worse <laughs> as you start adding these blink effects and bounce effects. So, I mean, these cards are powerful. Like this just should give you like an initial take on how powerful these cards really are, because I mean, this is ridiculous, right? I, you know, we're talking about pacifism on the kind of like, Oh, it seems fine, whatever. But now it's like sword supply shares, fiend hunter, herbis protector. Like these are big time cards that can really get the job done. So that's white. Let's move on to blue commons man of war. Yeah, it's back. It's in the set. And uh, we, we had it as a preview, and I'm super stoked for it. And it Couldn't looks quite awesome good. here, too. Yeah. So it's always good. Like, it's always good and limited. But like, I think that you can actually with use it. with or against Urbis Protector. If you play against it, you bounce their angel. If you play with it, you bounce your own protector. <laughs> totally. So that's awesome. And it's, of course, my boy. I'm not going to be passing too many of those. Sift. Sift so, is a nice one. Yeah. Sift is three and a blue for a sorcery. You draw three cards and then discard a card. Mm -hmm. And cards like this are why blue tends to be very good in this kind of set. And it was true in Iconic Masters. It's true in Cube. I mean, it's true in a lot of the sets where the strong theme, there aren't strong themes to really force you to be super synergistic and you're both kind of throwing good cards at each other. Because guess what? If we, if we spend a long game throwing cards at each other but, and, I, and I've cast two Sifts, like I'm up a lot of material and it's just going to be very difficult for you to win that kind of game. So... Yeah. Blue tends just to be really power. good. Ironically, blue tends to be worse in normal limited formats because stuff like this is usually not as good as whatever is going on in the normal set. And because, mm -hmm. you know, Secrets of the Golden City aside, card draw just doesn't tend to be quite this good anymore. Like Sift is just really high up there for common card draw. Right. Four mana draw three. Like, yeah, you have to throw away a land or something, but it's a four mana draw three. Yeah, no, it's it's a great card, and it feels great. Like, if you can get to a stable board state and just resolve a sift, you just feel like you're on top of the world. It feels awesome. Um, I picked Mystic of the Hidden Way. This is a type of card that's a little bit fragile, and there is a lot of removal, so it's not going to be like a, a windmill. But this card has always been fine. It's a four and a blue for a three-two that can't be blocked, um, but you can. it has morph. So you can pay it for three and then pay two and a blue to flip it up and start uh, getting in for damage. And it's just the kind of card that can just plow through a defensive deck and kind of demand a removal spell. And then Counterspell, like actual original Counterspell is in this set as well at common. So oh, you yeah. are going to see people countering your spells. If they play an island on turn one, start gearing up for the possible implications of blue, blue counter target spell. Are you stoked to be uh, countering, you know, actually countering some stuff? Oh, yeah. I, I, I like it because 
it leads to just a lot of interesting games. Like, yes, I, look, I understand that, you know, countering, getting your spells countered can be frustrating. And I'm not saying that's a great experience to have over and over again. But a lot of the more interesting games of Magic are when you don't just jam your highest casting cost card every turn. Because in a format with counter spells that are good, you you don't. You all of a sudden have, start to think about like, what if I play my second best card? And if they counter it, then they won't be able to counter my best card. And if they don't counter it, then at least get something on the board. Or what if there's counter spell wars where you're trying to figure out the best way to, to leverage, you know, your opponent leaving mana up and trying to maybe bait them into playing two, so you can play two spells in the same turn. And that's the kind of stuff you don't really get these days in normal limited formats. And while I don't think it's best to be the standard, it's good. It's good to have access to some of it. I, I do enjoy it. And I think there is something there. Do you think it's too powerful for, for like this type of environment? Cause we know that Wizards refuses to print it like back into standard or yeah, even let well, it in, would, in uh, would, modern. Would wreck standard. And I think mm -hmm. still be like, you, you could argue about whether it would be good enough for, or like how good it would be for the modern environment. But, mm -hmm. uh, I don't think we're going to see it anytime soon. I, I think it doesn't actually wreck limited very much. Like, okay. yes, it's good, but it's not like busted or, and it costs double blue. Like there's some formats where essence scatter would be better than counter spell. Right. <laughs> so, and, sure. and that's a card we see frequently. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mana leak also. Um, last one is horseshoe crab. That's the one that we mentioned before. Look, th this is a, as close as you're going to get to kind of a build around in the set like this, it's two and a blue for a one, three crab. And like Louis said earlier, you can pay a blue to untap it. And there's multiple effects of which I will outline later uh, that you can abuse with it, but it's a card to keep your eye on, but it is not a raw power level card. You, you need the other things to make it work. If you don't have them, it's, it's not even worth putting in your deck. I, I did actually want to mention one more common, which is fathom seer. Yeah. It's a one uh -huh. and a blue for a one, three, but you, it has morph. And to unmorph it, you return two islands you control and draw two cards when it turns face up. So it's gush. Mm -hmm. to yeah. And this is just another way to get extra cards because this is, is still a draw two plus a one three. At, at but the you cost have to return of, the two islands. Isn't that like pretty bad? It really or is. Pretty, like, pretty high cost, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So there's two things. One is that on a turn where you're going to miss a land drop anyway, this actually adds a mana to your mana pool because you get to mm -hmm. replay and tap the land and mm -hmm. it lessens the cost. And just in the late game, I'm at, this is a mold drifter, right? In the late game, you you play this, you unmorph it, you draw two cards, you're up a one, three, and two cards. And it's just, it's just another powerful card, another card which I expect to be good in this environment. Plus, All right. if you go really deep, you start, you know, uh, mana warring your own fathom seers to draw two cards. Oh, I like this. Just start looping them. Um, oh, it's slow, but it is effective. Yep. Uh, uncommons to keep your eye out on. Murder of Crows. This is three blue blue for a four four flyer. Whenever another creature dies, you can loot. Draw a card and discard a card. Oh, Murder of Crows is awesome. Oh, yeah. Murder of Crows is very good. And it shares a characteristic with the next two cards. In fact, all the, card, the the notable blue to uncommons. You got Merfolk Looter is next. You know, tap, draw a card, discard a card. And it's one in a blue for a one one. And then exclude two in a blue counter target creature and draw a card. So blue has... A, Three good card draw uncommons and a bunch of good card draw commons. But Merfolk Looter is absurd, right? Like this oh, is yes, a card that if you overlook this card, you are doing yourself a huge disservice. It is when you awesome. Have Looter, you essentially never draw lands again. You never get yeah. flooded. Yeah. Oh, and, and Or if you need lands, you can draw into them. Merfolk Looter is the truth. Seriously. I if, can't imagine mulliganing a hand that has two mana and a Merfolk Looter. Yeah. And, and, and also, and by the way, we should mention this. If you're on the other side of the table and you have the opportunity to kill a merfolk looter before your opponent untaps, do that. <laughs> kill the merfolk looter. Do not let it survive. Uh, I've seen way too many people think, oh, it's not that big of a deal. And then they just fall further and further and further behind because their opponent's hand is just sculpted into this masterpiece while the merfolk looter just does its thing. Blue looks awesome, by the way. I mean, Good God. Merfolk Looter, Mana War, Sift, Counterspell, Murder of Crows. I'm just like uh, I'm super in. in. Yep. Uh, all right. Let's take a look at Black uh, Commons. Murder. Murder is uh, your kind of de facto removal spell here. It's uh, one Black Black for an instant. It says destroy target creature. So great. Now that's now that one to me is, is a step above pacifism, for example. Oh, yes. This is much better than pacifism. It's instant speed and it kills it dead. Like if they play a merfolk looter and you've got a pacifism in your hand, you're not winning that exchange. Exactly. Where if you can just snap that thing off, uh, and again, you really should. Uh, Twisted Abominations, one that I picked. I really like this card. It's five and a green, excuse me, five and a black for a five, three, 
zombie mutant, and you can pay a black to regenerate it. So it's actually kind of a pain to deal with. But the really neat thing about it is that it's got swamp cycling. So that means that you can pay two mana, two, two generic mana, discard the Twisted Abomination, and go get a swamp out of your, your library and put it into your hand. And, and that's really nice because early in the game, if you need to hit a land drop, well, you can just swamp cycle your Twisted Abomination. But if you draw it late or if you've got a bunch of extra lands, it's actually kind of a pain. It's five power on a regenerator. They need a pacifism or something like that to deal with this because it blocks a lot of stuff and it attacks pretty well too. The uh, cycle of land cyclers is is a nice addition too. That just make, smooths everything out and makes it so you end up, yeah, just I think playing sweeter games. Yeah, and there's a there's a bunch there, there's one for each color, like you said. Um, next card is Phyrexian Ghoul. It's two and a black for a two two zombie. Has the the ability sacrifice a creature, and it gets plus two plus two until end of turn. This is an Antuco Husk. If you've ever seen that, and this one I picked because this is another one of those potential. Uh, kind of build around type cards. This actually has a lot of neat things that you can do with it in the set. You mentioned earlier, um, Act of Treason, which is two and a red sorcery, steal your opponent's creature for a turn, it gets haste and untap it. And Phyrexian Ghoul can let you do that and then just eat the creature so they don't get it back. Uh, and it also does a bunch of other neat stuff. Uh, and I'll actually outline that a little bit later too. So we'll hold off on that. But, but it, it, this, this card does have a reasonable number of synergies. Uh, you wouldn't want to play it just for value, but uh, if, if you've got some other stuff going on, you can do some neat stuff. Disfigure is in the set. That's black. Uh, instant target creature gets minus two, minus two. I like the combination of Disfigure and Sift. <laughs> it, cheap, cheap removal plus good card draws. Uh, is, is awesome. Gotcha. Yeah, that's really nice. And then another one that I like as a potential uh, build around-ish or card that you can maybe get some extra value from is Blood Hunter Bat. And that's three and a black for a two-two flying. And when it enters the battlefield, it drains your opponent for two. So they lose two, you gain two. So on its just on its own, it's close, but it's not amazing. But if you can cloud shift this, yeah, you, this uh, is the kind of card you, know, you can uh, recur a few times, and you know, with bounce or cloud shift or, or raise deads or yeah. what have you, and then exactly. It, yeah, and then it does what you want uh, with that draining, because that draining is actually quite a bit. It adds up really fast. Um, some of the uncommons, Ancient Craving. I've never actually played with this card that I remember. Oh, it's uh, powerful. Really. What, what, what is it from? It's from... there. It was from Portal, I believe, initially. Portal, this is a yeah, you're right. Black Sorcery at Uncommon, Draw Three Cards, Lose Three Life. Mm -hmm. And it's shown up under various names, too, like in some of the just weird portal sets. But I just I think I played it in like Master's Edition or something like that. Or um, I don't know. I, I've played with this card a bunch of times or different iterations of this card and is yeah, as good as advertised. Like you want removal spells and or you want to be aggressive or you want life gain. But if you meet any of those conditions, it's, it's a four mana draw three. Yeah. So again, just reloading and, and going back to what you said before about if, if, if all cards are powerful, you want more of them. And that's that. Uh, rap, you mentioned this uh, too. I think the quote is if all cards are powerful, no cards are powerful. That is not it. <laughs> if I have more. <laughs> Ravenous Chupacabra. We, the Chalupacabra. We, <laughs> yeah, we have not shaken him yet, but uh, back in the set, and you already know what we're going to say, goes along with all that sweet value. Again, Bounce and Blink both work great with Ravenous Chupacabra. There's nothing wrong with Chupacabra, kill your thing, Mana War, pick up Chupacabra, play Chupacabra, kill your other thing. That That is a you know two-turn or three-turn sequence. Right that is nice, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, But at the same time, Cloud shift my Chupacabra makes cloud shift into an instant speed murder, right? For one white mana. Just, of course, assuming that it doesn't get interrupted. So there's a lot to love about that. And I think Chupacabra is going to be uh, every bit the performer it is uh, as it was in, in the other set as well. It's just awesome, especially with rebuying it and, and getting it back from the graveyard and just casting it multiple times. Um, Zombify is in the set. That's three and a black sorcery. Return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. Guess what I could zombify? A ravenous chupacabra. That would be a good target. Yeah. So, and, and this really is the point is that 
There are perhaps some really big uh, cards, and I did actually pick a few of them out to talk about later, but you can also just zombify for value. It's all about getting those enter the battlefield triggers repeating. That's what you're trying to get over and over again. So that's what you should be keeping your eye out on. Also, Luis, I just had to mention this just for you and I, because it's like a nostalgia thing. Will of the Wisp is in this set. <laughs> yes, this is black <laughs> for a zero one flyer. And you can pay black to regenerate it. And I thought this card was awesome when I first started playing. And Me too. I, I, I knew my, you my, would. <laughs> my opinion hasn't changed, I guess. I think it's sweet. Uh, it doesn't actually sound great and limited now that I think no. about it. But no, I love it, it so whatever. I know. I just thought it was cool, right? Just that they on, put it back in. I gotta see picture it is. Eh. The, the fact that it's not the old picture does 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 hurt me a little bit. But I, I know. you know, whatever. I'll just I'll, I'll I'll like the concept of it without maybe yeah. like the execution. <laughs> it's tough because the old one was yes, Premier Force. And, you know, he's done a whole bunch of sweet cards and they tried. They got Rob Alexander to do this Will of the Wisp. And Rob Alexander is, you know, one of the top artists. But, yeah, the old one, you just can't you just can't lose that. Uh, let's move on to red uh, commons. Chandra's Outrage, two red, red instant. And it does four damage to a creature and two damage to that creature's controller. Or maybe it's just a player. But anyway, it does two to them and four to the creature. And uh, that is nice. Uh, that can pile on a lot of damage, especially in an aggressive deck. Uh, we've talked about Active Treason. That's the one that lets you steal their opponent's card. Ideally, you're not just playing it to steal it and hit them with it. You're doing valuable Clone things like sacrificing it. Yeah. That, that sort yeah. of thing. Uh -huh. the act, active Treason is actually one of the few like combo-ish feeling decks from looking at this set of cards. And Agreed. I, I think that there is something there because when your opponent taps out for something – like Colossal Dreadmo, which I believe is in every single set, you know, until the end of time yeah, now. Yeah, it's just forever now. <laughs> and you actively the treason, whack them, then, then sack it to something. You, you will win those games with the vast majority of the time. Did, did you see that somebody made a, a Colossal Dreadmo from Dominaria? <laughs> this is like, they just put the set symbol on it. I'm like, come on. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> like, it better would, not be that would, be that would be amazing. I kind of hope it's true. You just wanted to keep that train riding. Uh, Kindle is in this set. One in a red instant. It does X damage to target creature or player where X is two plus the number of cards named Kindle in all graveyards. And I have to admit, Luis, I thought that this did. I thought that it added two per Kindle in your graveyard. That would be a lot more powerful. Exactly. So it actually does two damage, then three damage, then four damage, you know, as you work your way up. I thought it was two, four, six. <laughs> Maybe I'm a little hopeful, but I haven't actually played Kindle that I remember in a, you know, over and over again or whatever. So I guess I just never got it. But anyway, it is still really good, right? Oh, it's a, two mana for deal two is, is fine. And then it, if you can pick up multiples, it, it will uh, scale up nicely. Also note it counts your opponent's Kindles. So right. Which and is it not, can go to the opponent's head as well. Yes, it's so not it typical of it. cards in this era that you would look at your opponent for this kind of effect. In the Kindle mirror, uh, you know, try to make sure you play all your Kindles last. Last, exactly. Um, Hordling Outburst is used to be a com an uncommon. Now yeah, it's, it's a common. common. This is, yeah, this is one, another powerful one. This is one red, red sorcery. Yeah. Make three, one, one uh, goblins. Because in a set with a lot of removal... Yeah, making a bunch of tokens is a good way to get around that. Like you could be playing one of these blue black decks and your hand is like, you know, disfigure, murder, sift, and they play a hoardling outburst and you're just like, Ugh, this is kind of annoying. Yeah, you don't want to have to kill those things one at a time. So that's cool. And then if there's any type of token synergies or go wide payoffs, I know Trumpet Blast is in this set. Th th those are the type of cards you want. Unfortunately, there aren't any goblin specific synergies where you're going to be able to pump them all up or whatever. But whatever, Hardly Now Burst is good on its own. Uh, I mentioned Chartooth Cougar here as well. That's the that cycle that the you were mentioning. Cycler. Yeah, so it's five and a red for a four four with fire breathing, and it has mountain cycling. So you can pay two to to cycle it away for a mountain. Again, just a solid six drop, but that also has this really good flexibility of getting you a land in the early game. Uncommons dun dun ah, lightning bolt is back. I think everybody knows what that one does. The, but and it's the, with the original Christopher Rush art. Is it? No. <laughs> oh, I was going to say there is no way that's true, right? No, it's the here. I'm going to look now. It's it's the commonly accepted current artwork from Christopher Muller. It's good. It's a good it's good artwork, but no. No. I had I still have my I have four beta lightning bolts, Luis, and I will never part with them. Wow, sick brags. I know. They're awesome. And guess what? I picked them up before they went up to a trillion dollars. Um Zodahedron <laughs> <I think> Grinder. <laughs> you what? 
I gave Owen Turtenwald four beta bolts when they before they became a trillion dollars. Also, but now they're a trillion dollars. I, I still have mine, but I had extra four, and he kept borrowing them, so I just let them let him have them. Yeah, they're like a hundred dollars each now. You're <laughs> so, extremely kind. I just gave him a very generous <laughs> gift. Yes, you did. Well, you know he's still using them more. He sold them already. Uh, Zada Hedron Grinder is a card that was rare, right? And and now it's uncommon. So this is three and a red for a three three. Uh, legendary creature, goblin ally. Whenever you cast an inner sor instant or sorcery spell that targets only Zada, you copy it for each other creature you control. Uh, each copy targets a different one of those creatures. So basically, if you like giant growth Zada, all your creatures get giant growth. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know if this is going to be great, but this just struck me as a potentially powerful build around that you're going to be able to see a lot more often. Uh, but you really do need the payoffs. Obviously, you're not going to play a, a, a you know four mana three three. Yeah, uh, and I would look for it, you know ways that you really get a big bonus, like a uncaged fury. Right, is another is a common, which gives a creature plus plus one and double strike. Like that, that's pretty savage to to copy. Oh yeah, especially if you're doing the hordling outburst thing or whatever. Just get them. Um, Spike shot goblin. Now this one is interesting to me because. What I want to talk to you about for this one, Luis, is how good it is on its own, because it's two and a red for a one, two goblin shaman. You can pay red, tap it uh, to do damage equal to its power to creature or player. So on the surface, it's red, tap, do one. Now, if you can augment that, well, then that obviously anything above one and it's fantastic. But is it good enough at just one? It is because it threatens all your opponent's X ones. It makes it so all your one ones trade up for two twos and your opponent doesn't know that you don't have a way to pump it. So it might impact how they play as well. Spike shot was the best common in Mirrodin block, which is a very powerful set. So I'm not surprised to see it coming back as uncommon. And I think it's likely going to be what you want to first pick almost every time you see it. Yeah. Now the thing is I did take a quick look and there's not a lot of, you know, there's not, a lot of equipment and stuff to just laying around to make this thing into three. Now you have to actually put in a little work to do it. So make sure that you're okay with it just being one for a lot of the time and you'll be good. The last card I wanted to mention from red uh, uncommons was pyroclasm. Um, that, you know, probably more in the sideboard camp, but uh, extremely powerful in the right matchup. Like it, it goes from being maybe in your sideboard to being the best card in your deck, you know, against the hardly outburst deck or against the, you know, all well, the spike shot goblins and all that kind of stuff. Uh, let's talk about the green commons. Uh, Epic Confrontation. That's the one that we opened in our crack a pack, the one that gives your creature plus uh, one plus two and tell them to turn for one and a green and then it fights another creature you don't control. It's just a green removal spell. So you'll need to, you'll need to know uh, about that one. Um, oh, I love this next card so much. Woolly Loxodon. This is the I one I mentioned. I why you're highlighting well. this. This isn't like one of the best green cards or anything. It totally is. Loxodon? Is it? It's, it's not definitely a, in the top five. Um, I don't know that it's it's as good as Ambassador Oak. Yeah, it probably is. Fine. Wait, Dude, Elvish Loxodon. Elvish Aberration is way better than the Loxodon. No way. Yeah, it's way better. It's big or small. It's big or another land, depending on which one you need. Okay, okay, that, that card is really good. I agree, but I still think Loxodon's like right up there. This guy's just it's a, sweet. Oh, it's a morph that you can unmorph for a, what six man, five in a green, and it's a six seven yeah. when you unmorph it, or it costs yeah, a seven mana six seven. Yeah, vanilla. Yeah, it's like <laughs> it's huge. It, it is big. <laughs> it's it is big, and it it uh, does come out on turn three. Like if you just need to play a three drop. Yeah. Okay, well, it, it, we'll we'll see how it does, but uh, yeah, I'm I'm maybe I'm biased. I'm <laughs> I'm in love with the Loxodon, uh, Giant Growth, right? Just super efficient pump spell if you're looking to attack on the ground with any type of green deck. Giant Growth is going to let you win combat basically every time. Green target creature gets plus three plus three until end of turn. Uh, cultivate. Now, this is one that I'm not as sure about because I'm not quite sure how well the multicolored deck is going to come together. But Cultivate, if that deck is a thing, will be an important part of it, as it's just a powerful spell. It's two and a green sorcery. Search your library for up to two basics. Reveal them. Put one of them on the battlefield tapped and the other one in your hand. It ramps you and fixes your mana, and it's also card advantage in that way. Like, you're getting two cards out of this one, even if they happen to be land. So th th there's a lot of power in a card like Cultivate, but it does need the shell around it. So we're going to have to experiment and see if there's a four or five color deck, and in which case you might want to be base green with Cultivate.
And then also Arc good in a two color deck. It's just a good card, right? Like if you're if you have stuff to spend money on or money mana on. You yeah. you're getting a two for one off this. You don't need like tons of seven drops. Yeah. I think as long as you know yeah. you have a normal limited deck curve, you you'll almost you basically always play this unless you're an aggro deck. Especially with splashes, of course. Right. Um, Arbor Elf is, of course, very powerful. There's a lot of Especially powerful white mana creatures. What's that? Oh, yeah, definitely. Which is also in the set. So, right? I think it is. Yeah. It is. Uh, it's green. A, another common that's better than Willy Lockstone. There's dozens of them. There's not dozens. Uh, there's, there's not even dozens of green commons. Uh, green 1-1, one, one, untap to untap target for us. And like you said, you can play Utopia Sprawl, which is green. My biggest uh, complaint uh, with uh, Arbor Elf is playing it on Magical Line is extremely uh, annoying. Yes, I agree. But you know what? Sometimes you do what you got to do, right? Um, Maybe you, I'm you not going to take it because of it, but... <laughs> yeah. Utopia Sprawl is green uh, for an aura that enchants a forest. And as it enters the battlefield, you choose a color. Whenever the forest is tapped for mana, you get the, a mana of the chosen color as well. So it's just another ramp spell. Um, when it comes to uncommons, there's Iwamori of the Open Fist. Um, this is 2GG for a 5-5 five, five Trampler, and it's legendary. And when it enters a battlefield, each opponent may put a legendary creature card from their hand onto the battlefield. It's, this used to be a rare, I'm assuming. Yes, it was a rare. Uh... <laughs> extremely rare sounding text box there. But it's a 5-5 five, five Trample for four, which is absurd. And I, I mean, you're not getting punished that often, right? Oh, like you, this is You very rarely are. When you do, it's going to be bad, but... <laughs> really 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 Look, yeah. the, the best thing I can say about this card was back when I used to do a lot of uh, team drafts, <laughs> there was a, an unnamed person whose nickname was Iwamori of the Open Wallet. So let's just let's just say that. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know who that is now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, unnamed. So, all right. Uh, Ranker is in the set. Green. And it's an aura that enchants a creature. Creature gets plus two, plus zero, and has trample. And when Ranker is put in the graveyard from the battlefield, uh, you put it back into your hand. Cards, it's weird. You read it, and it's like, that seems fine. But when you play against it, you're like, oh, my God. It's just a beating, right? It just enables attacks left and right and just doesn't stop because it keeps coming back over and over again. This card is going to be a little bit surprising to people because you can't destroy it with, like, Enchant removal. No. It, it's, no if it's the only way to really get it is to counter it or kill the creature out from under it, right? Yeah, in response, you mean. Yes. Like, yeah. they, they target their creature with Ranker. Yeah, and you that's what I meant. Kill. Yeah, in or, response. Yeah, yeah. Kill, so Ranker never resolves. So Ranker is, Ranker is a beating. Ranker used to be a yeah. common and is very difficult to fight against because all their creatures are not only not really chumpable, but big enough that they're going to trade off and they just keep getting Ranker back. So this is one of the few really good aggressive green cards. Yeah, it's insane. Uh, Crows and Tuskers, one that I'll, I have my eye on as well. It's five green green for a six five boar beast. But the cool part is, <laughs> is it has cycling for two and a green. When you cycle it, you may search your library for a basic land card, reveal it, and put it into your hand, then shuffle. Then you draw a card after that. So it's kind of a built in two for one word. Before you draw, that's awesome. Oh, it does. Yeah, that's nice. Uh, anyway, that's just a powerful, flexible. Uh, card, you know, j just the three mana instant of draw a card, go no, get a land is, is already fine. perfect split card. It's a split card, you know, rampant mm -hmm. growth, draw a card, or just seven mana, six, five. So there's really no green deck that would not want to play this. Right. But it does go in your hand, right? Not on the battlefield. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Sorry. Not rampant yeah, yeah, growth. Okay. Uh, it's whatever the equivalent of searching for a, for a lot for a card. Is there, is there a card by the way that does it? Or I guess just like a, so a two of ether. Yeah. Lay of the land. Like Lay of the land. Lay of the land. Lay of the land. There you go. We did it. <laughs> uh, anyway, so, yeah. So green looks great, though. I mean, to me, like, it is bringing a lot of beef. It just needs weights to well, get that th beef this is through. Saying so I think that Rancor is, like, super important here. Yeah, this is why I was saying I wouldn't mind first picking lower scale Quaddle, just because blue and green tend to do well in these kinds of sets. Because even mm -hmm. if green doesn't have the best commons, it usually can play cards like Cultivate and cast, and you know, uncommons like Crows and Tusker and cast all the best commons. And... Uh, you know, from other colors and just cards like Rancor and Giant Growth and Epic Confrontation are all pretty nice individually. Right. Okay. So what I've done is we've got a few things to go through. So first, there was uh, some gold cards that I just wanted to highlight as potentially signposts or just really sweet cards. Uh, we don't need to go super deep, but I just wanted to mention them. And then I did pick out a couple of the 
uh, possible um, synergistic type one, two punches, because that's kind of a sub theme for the set is combining these cards uh, at, that are good with one another, but not necessarily broad synergy. So first the gold cards, <sighs> cloud blazer is in this set mm. and I am thrilled about it. Three white blue for a two, two flyer. When it enters the battlefield, you draw two cards and gain two life. Yes, 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 yes. I am going to cast that. I'm going to return it to my hand with man of war. I'm going to recast it. Then I'm going to cloud, whatever it, I am stoked. I think no, that, you're not feeling it. I think that I'm going to have a hard time not first picking Cloud Blazer if I see it in the pack because oh, if, super if, picking Cloud Blazer. If what? you're either of the colors, it's really easy to splash the other one, and the reward is completely worth it. Dude, if I find out that you didn't first pick Cloud Blazer, we have a problem. Like, this is not this is not good for our friendship. If you're not if you're not going to Cloud first pick Cloud Blazer. Uh, mm -hmm. Speaking of Shadow Mage Infiltrator, one blue black for a one three with fear. So it can't be blocked except for an artifact or black creatures. Whenever it deals combat damage to a player, you may draw a card. Shadow Mage Infiltrator is, is sweet. Uh, you know, just Finkel's getting less and less legendary every single day. <laughs> I'm not going to be the one to tell him. Uh, so this next card is called Quick Silver Dagger. It's really interesting. I've never actually played it. I don't know what it's from, it's but from it's from Apocalypse. Apocalypse. Okay. So that explains why. Uh, one blue red for an Ored enchants a creature, uh, and it has... The, the enchanted creature has tap. This creature deals one damage to target player. You draw a card. So, yeah, this basically makes one of your creatures into a jam day tome, into a book, and into a way to draw an additional card every turn, mm -hmm. which offsets the vulnerability of it being an aura. Since if you can land this while they're tapped out, you at the very least had parity. And if your creature survives, you're going to win very quickly, especially if it's a horseshoe crab. Exactly. So that's that's the thing there. A uh, card that I've always liked, Pillory of the Sleepless One, black, uh, white for it, and an aura that enchants a creature. The enchanted creature can't attack or block. So it's just like pacifism, but it also has enchanted creature has at the beginning of your upkeep, you lose one life. So this is one of my favorite win conditions because it's just the slow bleed. It's just like the, the worst way to go out. Yeah, totally. So that's a sweet one. Um, I mentioned lower, we mentioned lower scale coatle because we opened it in our pack. And then, oh my God, Luis, this is, this is one of the most Scott the, Vargasian the, cards I've ever it's played in my life. Cloud Blazer. It's a Bayloth Knoll. It's four yeah. green black for a four five. And when it enters the battlefield, you return up to two target creature cards from your graveyard to your hand. So, eh, I mean, I love splashing this card too. What can I say? Yeah, I, I, to me, this this defines a lot of how you want to play limited. <laughs> just the grindiest. Oh, I would be playing this card like in Grixis, you know? <laughs> like <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. There you go. Um, okay, so let's talk about combos because, um, you know, we're not talking like when we say combo about like those I won the game, I comboed off type combos. We're just talking about these one-two punches that can generate a big in-game advantage. So for let's start off with one of the cards we mentioned before, Phyrexian Ghoul. This is the sacrifice outlet for to the two two for two and a black that you can sacrifice a creature uh there's also by the way an uncommon fallen angel which is three black black for a three three flying and uh it also has sacrifice a creature in this case it gets plus two plus one until in a turn instead but both of these are free and i mean manaless ways to have a sacrifice outlet on the board so these are the types of cards that you want to look at and say, well, how can I do these? Well, Act of Treason is one. We mentioned it before. You steal their creature, attack them with it, and then sacrifice it so they don't get it back. That's nice. Um, and then Mesmeric Fiend and Fiend Hunter are the ones that I wanted to kind of go deep on because there, there's a lot to be said for it. And I'm going to actually talk about those in the context of Cloud Shift, though most of that same stuff applies to Phyrexian Ghoul and Fallen Angel about yeah. when you would sacrifice Basically, it. Cloud Shift and Phyrexian Ghoul and Fallen Angel are the exact same thing in this context, which is if you put the ability of Fiend Hunter or Mesmeric Fiend, both fiends, funnily enough, uh, I guess one hunts fiend, one is a fiend, on the stack and then remove it, whether it be, a, be via Cloud Shift or Phyrexian Ghoul slash Fallen Angel, It'll then trigger its leaves play ability, which says bring the thing back, but there's nothing to bring back because you haven't resolved the first ability. The net result is whatever you target will be exiled forever. And there's no way to get it back. That's right. And in the case of Cloud Shift, all of those things happen except for you get an extra enter the yes, battlefield yes. ability that will take something as well. Like, so imagine those things are really powerful. Two five fives in play. You can play Fiend Hunter, target one. Cloud shift it, it comes back, target the other. The first one's gone forever. The second one is gone until Fiend Hunter comes back. And that's, yeah. I mean, that's really powerful. 
Right. And then in the case of the Phyrexian Ghoul and the Fallen Angel, you're just using it as like a three mana exile a creature and then you get a pump on your creature. But still, those are really nice. And then of course against Dex removal. Exactly. And then of course there's the, you know, perfectly fine combo of just like hordely now burst, right? You could just make your ghoul into an, a potential eight eight and make yeah. your opponent block or make awkward for nine with a fallen angel. Yeah. So those things happen too. Uh, I mentioned Zombify earlier, three and a black sorcery. You get a creature card from your graveyard back onto the battlefield. You know, you can use this, of course, on a huge bomb. If you have some like Merfolk looter, discard my Acroma, get it back. Great. That's, that's really cool. You should do that. But this set isn't really set up for that specifically. But what you can do is use it just to get back into the battlefield effects like your ravenous chupacabra that we mentioned before. Or you can also use it in kind of a cool way. There's these basic land cyclers that we talked about, you know, and they, they typically cost like six mana and they're pretty powerful cards to have on the battlefield. There's nothing wrong with turn two basic land cycle. So you hit your land drop. And then if you hit your next one, you zombify it back and boom, you've got, you know, this five, three with rented regeneration or a four, four fire breather, stuff like that, that, you know, significantly ahead of schedule. And that's just a nice little combo for a zombify as well, because it gives you the ability to get creatures in the graveyard kind of on command and for value. So that's nice. Um, all right. This is one of the big ones. Okay. The, the, the horseshoe crab is a serious build around in this set. It's again, two and a blue for a one, three with the activated ability, blue untap horseshoe so crab. It to, seems awful. Yeah. To be clear, this is not playable on its front, but yeah. if you do get one of the engine cards, then it be, it gets out of hand really quickly. Right. So some of the cards that you can get are cards like Heavy Arbalest that we mentioned. That's the equipment that lets you tap it to do two damage. Now you just pay blue to untap, do two more. Blue to untap, do two more. I mean, you're killing six drops or just killing your opponent I before the... You know, heavy Arbalest is the best combo with it. Like even mm -hmm. better than Quicksilver Dagger, the one we just mentioned where you draw a card each time. Because yeah. this keeps you ahead on board. If you Heavy Arbalest, you can just mow down their entire board and then yes. you'll, you'll just, just win from there. Uh Additionally, we have Presence of Gone, the enchantment that lets it tap to make a 1-1 one, one elf for two and a green. Yes. So, so again, you can just spit out a whole bunch of elves. And then uh, Retraction Helix, which bounces a non-land permanent. Yeah. And the the thing that you do have to keep in mind, though, with your horseshoe, horseshoe crab combos is that it's blue mana to untap. So that's your restriction, is how many blue mana can you make? So you would much prefer to have your horse, horseshoe crab decks be a little skewed even heavier towards blue so that if you do set up one of these relatively precarious combos you actually get to go off right like i want to i want to have it i want to go big i want to be able to activate my my horseshoe crab four times or something right and just bang 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 because again you also get spotted the first activation like if you get the arbalest on it you know it's your horseshoe crabs untap that first time and then it doesn't untap anymore because the arbalest but still um next card there's it's cloud shift. And this is one that, you know, this is why it made that, that list that we did earlier. Um, because look, you can bound, you can blink lots of stuff, ETB stuff, ravenous chupacabra, blood hunter, bad herbis protector, man of war, all at instant speed for cheap and maybe even under removal or something like that, which is fantastic. And you also can just use it for kind of its more normal phase, which is, like what you would imagine when you first see it, which is, oh, they pointed murder at my best creature. I'll cloud shift it to save it. That's fine too. Like there's nothing wrong with using it for that. And then you really can go off with those cards that Luis outlined a minute ago. The, uh, you know, the cards like Fiend Hunter and Mesmeric Fiend, those, those type of cards, you just get extra, you know, supreme extra value out of those as well. Um, one other thing that you can do that's really neat is you can unmorph creatures with this. Yeah. If you so, have, uh, a, a mm -hmm. nice thick morph creature. You you can uh, like a woolly loxodon. Thick. Oh god. Oh god. Yeah, you, a woolly loxodon. Sure. You know, there's better than that too. There's a chroma angel of fury in this set. I mean that that that's a that's a legacy combo right there. You get to there you go. Or, or modern even. You you get to you, instead of flicker wisp here, you've got a cloud shift. But yeah, you get to morph it, cloud shift it, and bam, you you get your chroma. Yeah, so when you play a morph face down, if you do cast this on it, it will come back face up. So that's pretty cool. Um, and so these are just some of the, I just wanted to give like a, a quick example of some of the two card combos. This is what you should be looking for because again, this set's not about the big overarching uh, right, things. So it's more about assembling a bunch of these to get your value. You know, in previous Masters editions, you'd have like a affinity deck or a tokens deck or a fairies deck where... 18 of your 23 cards are part of this engine and geared towards this combo. Here it's like 
I have two horseshoe crabs and an arbalest and a retraction helix plus a bunch of normal cards. Or I have, you know, two cloud shifts to go with my three or four enter the battlefield effect creatures and uh, a one active season because that, you know, that's enough of a package. You're, you're not really trying to draft like, you're not trying to draft a deck where every single pick goes towards this goal, nor should you be looking to because you're going to be disappointed if that's what you're looking looking to do. And you, you mm-hmm. instead are just going to be drafting this deck of all good cards that has some combos that combine two cards to, you know, get a 10 out of 10 synergy, but it doesn't take a critical mass or anything like that. It's like a blue block control deck that finishes the game with <laughs> Horseshoe Crab, Arbalest, or, or even Quicksilver Dagger off the splash. Yeah. And the, the so let's get to the takeaways because th- there are some cards that, you know, that I, I'm interested in the black, white blinky deck, right? Uh, that and sacking stuff. That seems pretty cool. Uh, active trees and stuff. I really want to play blue, white. That seems to be like the most value centric one with the cloud blazers and the mana wars and the white main lines I mean, and I, cloud shifts and stuff. I, I am not, <laughs> I'm not about this life. I'm, I'm, I'm looking to take all the cultivates and sifts and then just play all the sweet cards. Oh, I like that. That sounds fun too. So here's some takeaways uh, before you sit down for your first and maybe only Masters 25 draft. This set is expensive and and we know that. Um, But this feels closer to super powerful chaos draft than it does to a normal master set. It is not about streamlined archetypes, but instead it's all about raw power and card to card synergies. Think more of baseline limited strategies here like curve out aggro, inevitability control, or some flavor of mid-range most likely. And the thing that really stands out to me and that makes me really excited to play this set is that we haven't seen a set quite like this. Like this has cube-like elements, but like most of the lessons that we teach you here on LR about limited are going to apply to this quite directly, where if we unleashed you on the vintage cube, they would oh, yeah. not apply no, as no, well, we have right? To completely reframe it, yeah. which is why we have those cube episodes. Right. And I think that's really exciting because I think that this set looks super fun. And I love that we still get to play limited. It's just pumped up to 10, right? Because these cards are this very looks like, powerful. Looks like Iconic Masters, but I am more excited for this than Iconic Masters. And I liked Iconic Masters. Okay. So great. Looks really fun. Like I said, I've already done one and it was sweet. And uh, look for videos and stuff on Channel Fireball from both Luis and I. And while you're there, sell your cards back. That's one thing that you can always do at CFB is take that pile of rares that you've got from drafting, send them back in and you'll get 30% bonus. If you want to trade them in for store credit, you can get whatever you want from CFP with that store credit. Or if you just need the cash, you can just get cash as well. If you want to find us on social media, I'm Marshall underscore LR and Luis is LSV. You can find everything related to the podcast at LRcast.com, all the links and everything for Luis's stream and the Facebook group and the the subreddit and everything is over on LRcast.com. Thanks so much for hanging out and good luck in your first and hopefully subsequent Masters 25 drafts. We'll see you next time. So I'm introducing a new segment here, Marshall, and you will be the arbiter. Ooh, I'm a good arbiter. I like arbiting. Yeah, so it's called Genius or Grifter. I'm going to tell you some situations Genius that have happened okay. in uh-huh. magic matches. And you're going to let okay. me know if the person committing them is a genius. And this is a nice, cunning, you know, awesome and, uh, uh, you know, move or a grifter. Someone okay. who's, who's getting away with something, angle shooting. Not oh, just, man. Not necessarily <laughs> okay. cheating. So the, the bar should not be exactly cheating because some of this stuff could be, some of this could not be. But whether you would whether you would tell the story and at the end of it think like, wow, this person's a genius or Ugh, this person's a grifter. So Okay. I love this. All right. Lay it on episode me. Episode one. Number one, the picking up the pen trick. You know, your, your opponent's deciding whether to attack. You pick up the pen like you're going to write down your new life total. They attack and you're like, bam, you know, 4-4 four, four flash. Genius or grifter? Grifter. Oh, you do not like the pen trick. All right. I hate the pen trick. I think <laughs> the pen trick is nonsense. <laughs> to be clear, this is, that is legal. I will also tell you yes. insofar as my understanding, which, you know. It is. Um, number two, you call a judge. You walk away from the table, ask a nonsense question. It doesn't matter what it is. You come back, and then you play Pithing Needle, and you name Birds of Paradise. You, you, Pithing Needle does not actually stop birds from tapping for mana, but your opponent uh-huh, uh-huh. presumably is, is, is at least somewhat led astray by, by your confident naming of it as for asking the judge a question. Genius or grifter? Yeah. Genius. That is awesome. Right, <laughs> and also kind of – that is hilarious. Yes, I love that. 
All right. Well, uh, that one is legal, I believe, though. Just try not to waste the judge's time too much. Um, your opponent writes down their life total wrong, you notice, and you change change your pad to match theirs. Genius or grifter? Oh, that's that's grifter. That's, yeah, that's straight. Just straight up illegal. Yeah. Don't do this. Yeah. Right. <laughs> You play a promo dried arbor near your lands. Genius or grifter? God. That is all right. That is straight grifter. And you were a grifter when you put it in your deck. Well, not was, when you put okay, it in well, your deck. Okay, that answers my sub sub my sub question was playing yeah. promo dried arbor at all. <laughs> <laughs> I I yeah. yeah I, both both I mean, are grifter. I think it's it. actually I hate that card. illegal to play it near your lands. And especially in a deceptive manner, but honestly, neither should be legal. I, we both hate the promo dried arbor, just like basically everyone we know. Uh, Sir, this I one's made a video about it. I hate that card so much. Yeah, uh, This one actually happened at, at the World Championships uh, many years ago. Trinisphere is in place. As all spells cost at least three. Spells that cost less than three, you have to pay colors to make them cost three. Mm -hmm. You have Ingot Chewer in your hand. This is a 3-3 three, three for 5 that destroys an artifact, but you can evoke it for a single red mana. It lets you play it, but then sacrifice it. Like a Mold Drifter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're not sure how this interaction works, but you think it doesn't work. You think you have to pay 3. You only have 1 mana. But you call a judge. The judge says, no, you can evoke it for 1 mana. You shrug, evoke it, kill the Trinosphere, go, go on to win. That is not how it works. The judge was wrong. You actually have to pay 3 for, for the Ingot Chewer. If you... Weren't if coming into this you thought it worked the other way, but you call the judge because you weren't a hundred percent sure. The judge verifies it. Is this genius or grifter? Oh, that's interesting. I'm gonna say genius. And and the reasoning is because you asked you did what you were supposed to do. You asked the judge. Like, I don't think you should have to appeal the judge's ruling unless you really Unless you're really pretty sure that it doesn't work that way. Like, you could easily get into Grifter if you knew. <laughs> like, if you just knew but were just hoping that the judge would tell you that it worked the way you wanted it to, then that would be pure Grifter to me. But if you genuinely didn't know and you said, all right, I'm going to ask the judge and the judge told you, no, you can do that, then I would, I would believe the judge. Yeah, I think it really just depends on your level of confidence. If you're 100% sure and you're just angling, that's a Grifter. And I think that's completely legal if you're not sure – the judge tells you how it works. It's not really a. It's not really your responsibility to appeal because you're like not sure. <laughs> like, right. Although I would really hope that my opponent would say, actually, that's not how it works. But yeah. anyway, since they were playing Trinisphere. All right, and the last one. Your opponent has a morph creature in play, and they they crack an evolving wild. You shuffle and then cut, so your their decks now on top of their morph. And then, <laughs> what? So imagine you they've got a morph, you, you cut their deck, putting the top of their deck on top of their morph, so then they you know they you cut your their deck to be on top of their morph, so now it's just the bottom card okay. in their library. <laughs> okay, this is you don't have to answer. This is insanely grifter. Insanely illegal. Also, Mike Long actually did it. <laughs> oh my god. Like, it's I also kind of genius. That. that is in a, in a very grifter way, yes, that is absurd. <laughs> All I've right, never so heard that. Episode one of Genius or Grifter. It oh will be back. Oh my god! I I love Genius or Grifter. <laughs>